All right, friends, let's get into this next session. This is right before lunch, and so I got the, uh, the task of just bringing us up to, uh, to some uh, Chipotle. And so today I want to talk about a really important part of your team, and that's your wife. And as Richard said earlier, if you are unmarried today, you are what we call a free agent. And... Um, and I would be curious in the room, I, and I don't mean to say this to, to isolate any one individual, but are, uh, if, you're, if you're an unmarried guy, let me just see your hands because we want to see who you are here today. Okay, for whatever reason, maybe single, divorced, uh, maybe uh, whatever the case may be, I want to encourage you in this session, would you hang in, would you not find this to be in any form or fashion irrelevant, but would you glean what you can out of this kind of marriage talk and uh, would you get from the text, the text that we're going to go to today, uh, something that's perhaps even bigger than marriage, and that would be in regards to your relationship with Jesus Christ. The, the passage of Scripture is Ephesians chapter 5. If you want to turn there in your Bibles, we'll have it on the screen as well if that helps you. But Ephesians chapter 5 is not just a passage about marriage. It's really a passage about the love of Jesus. It's about his um, passion and compassion for the church, for his body, whom he died for. And so I want to take you to this passage as you're turning there and as you're trying to find that. I want to let you know that um, this is when we talk about, you know, a, a tenderness that, that Greg just referred to. Uh, this isn't a level of tenderness on my part, but it's just a, a position of real vulnerability in the sense that I want to talk to you about marriage. I've been married for 28 years, uh, Denise. And uh, we have, you know, four kids. We have three grandbabies. Um, and it's interesting that Rich would have assigned me this topic. And you would know this level of interest. But uh, it's interesting to me that this topic would be assigned in the sense that, and this is not some private conversation. I'm not asking to hang on to this confidentially. But, but this is just one of those seasons. How many, I don't know how many guys that are married go through seasons where you just go, Man, whether it's like a couple weeks or a month or, you know, maybe it's an extended period of time, like a year or whatever it is, where you just go through those seasons in marriage where you go, well, this one's just a little bit tougher. You know those seasons? Now, I don't want to be like, uh, I'm not looking for you to commiserate with me here, but how many of you have ever just been in one of those seasons where you just go, oh, yeah, okay, all right. But this is one of those. This is just one of those. I think as we're watching um, our children, and we've got just, you know, they're, we have a 17-year-old as our youngest. The rest are, you know, they're adults, and they're moving on. They're having their own children. They're getting their own houses. They're, they're moving away, and we're starting to approach this empty nester thing, and it's a different day, and there's a different way of approaching Approaching marriage and there's a different way of approaching our relationship. We're having to kind of retool some things and kind of look at each other again and go, okay, hi, what was your name again now? Um, you know, and why, you know, we don't have babies around. We're not changing diapers and cleaning up poop and, and vomit. And, and uh, we're just, we're in a different day. And boy, lest you, you know, hear me say something like, wow, you know, you leave this room going, Pastor John's in a real tight spot in his marriage. No, that's not it. It's just a different day. We're having to think through things just a little bit more intentionally, and we're having to um, plan out what the next 28 years of our marriage or more uh, would be, and how can we do that successfully? How will we finish well? Too many marriages finish. They don't finish well. And today I want to talk to you about how you can finish well. And I take you to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians 5, very familiar passage of scripture, uh, particularly when it comes to marriage. Uh, beginning in verse 21, picking up the text, reading through verse 32, and then we'll unpack this. I just want to teach through this passage of scripture. As a Bible teacher, here's my, my, uh, my, my task today is really to walk you through this passage. Let's start in verse 21. It says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body, for which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church, gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. 
For this reason, now this is a quote back to the Old Testament. For this reason, a man will leave his father and his mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, Paul the Apostle says. This is a profound mystery. But I'm talking about Christ and the church. Everyone say this phrase with me. Marriage is a mystery. Say it real loud. Let's do it one more time. Marriage is a mystery. It's a mystery. If you've been married for more than like five minutes, you know that to be true. It's a mystery, okay? We need to admit that. And I want to admit to you today, as I've just had just a second ago, I don't fully get all of it. I don't fully know how to do it. I've had individuals will, will ask, well, how do you have such a great marriage? And, and your kids, and they're serving Jesus, they're in ministry, and they're doing such great things. And, and I don't know. I don't know. I'm not going to try to uh, BS you today to, into thinking that you leaving this room going, well, he's got the perfect marriage and, and he's got it all figured out. I do not. I do not get it. Uh, some things you just stumble into. Some things you have a level of intentionality with. Uh, but I'm telling you, as I have, and some of you have been married longer than I have, you know this to be true. It is a mystery, but this passage of scripture seems to be dealing with something b bigger and broader, not just marriage. It seems to be talking about the church and Jesus' love for the church, for his body that he died for. And even that, if we really were to be honest, is a mystery to us. We don't understand that fully, how he did all of that and why he did all of that. You know, years ago, there was a book, it was written, and it, this book was called Everything I Know about women and marriage. That was the book title. Everything I know about women and marriage. It was 200 pages long, and when you open it, all the pages were blank. <laughs> Literally, you could buy this book. It was such a great, what a great book. In other words, this author, I don't remember the author's name, but this author basically was saying, he knows nothing. He knows nothing. And, and neither do I really. I, when, I, when I think about marriage, I, I do... I do have the word of God. I've got models and mentors, as we've heard earlier. But when it really comes down to it, there is a struggle and there is a humility. Okay, I want that word to settle in. There's a humility in approaching our marriages and just saying, God, would you help? Would you guide? Would you inform? And we have the word of God. And by the way, these pages are not empty these pages are not empty. And so we go to the word today and we find hints and we find clues and we find uh, some direction from the scriptures, not only how to have a healthy marriage, but how to have a healthy church and how to be a healthy follower of Jesus Christ. And, and, and we need that. We need all that this word would give us because, and this is the great thing that we need to admit here together, is marriage is really hard. It's hard. It's not easy. Um, I think it's why we have so many like catchy um, country western songs, right? It's because of like, because of, of hard, you know, marriages that are difficult. Like I, I ran across this song title. It's the song, this country western song, obviously. It, it goes like this. It goes, she ripped out my heart and she stomped that sucker flat. That's the title of that song. <laughs> There's one more. Um, another country western song says, I sure do miss him but my aim is improving. <laughs> yeah, so, and, and we know, we know, we don't need a country music song to tell us that marriage is difficult, marriage is hard, and, 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 and there's a lot of reasons why. Uh, Les and Leslie uh, Parrot or Perot, I forget how they pronounce their name, but they wrote a book called When Bad Things Happen to Good Marriages, and in it, they just point out, they mention six things, six you know, bad things that can happen to good marriages. I'm just going to give them to you quickly, so I'm not going to settle on this very long, but I want to just establish the fact that, it, that really bad things can happen. Even in good marriages, you could just see things creep in, and he gives us, the, they, this couple gives us these six things. The first was busyness, and we know that to be true. Uh, irritability, boredom, drift, you know, that just that subtle kind of just disconnect with one another, that drift that happens. Uh, the fifth one was debt. And, and, and the sixth one were secrets. So let me give it to you one more time in case you're taking notes on that. These six things that enter into good marriages, they're bad things, but busyness, irritability, boredom, drift, debt, and, and secrets. Man, 
It makes marriage very difficult. They're, they actually then mention four just really brief ones that uh, are things that can jolt marriages. They can just kind of cause something to happen, this little ripple or this jolt that can take place in a marriage. And that they, those were addiction, uh, infidelity, in, in, um, infertility was the third one they gave, and loss. Loss of a job, loss of, uh, of, a, of a loved one, some kind of grief uh, that can take place in a marriage. I'll give them to you just one more time. Addiction, infidelity, infertility, and, and loss. And I, I mention these things because there are so many forces that can bring harm to our marriages or they can just make them really difficult. Again, I don't want to depress anyone here, but, but we have to admit that it's not easy. I mean, next to following Jesus, I would say being married, and this is not the fault of my wife, it's the fault of me, but being married is one of the more difficult things I've ever done next to following Jesus. And then raising children, and there's great joy found in all of those things, but we have to acknowledge where if we are not locked in really tight upon the Lord, if we're not following him wholeheartedly, if we don't have the right kind of people around us encouraging us, coaching us, man, this thing can get really difficult. And some of you know what I'm talking about. You've walked through painful marriages. Maybe you're, you're walking through, right, even right now, a separation or a divorce or or you've, uh, you've had bad, bad kind of connections with, with gals that, that have left you wounded, maybe things that have been said to you or relationships that went sideways. All those things are really kind of the way the culture is, is pushing at us and saying, you know what, uh, I, I can even remember times I've stood right back here where we have been marrying people. I'm stood right back there with the, with the groom and we're just getting ready to walk out right here. And, um, and he turns around and looks at me and he has that look in his eyes. I'm like, you ready to do this, buddy? And he goes, yeah, I'm scared though. Well, yeah, you should be. You should be. This is gonna be one of the hardest things you've ever done. I mean, we can just run out the side door if we need to. And then we walk out and, and invariably, they're giddy, they're excited. You know, there's that kind of sense of we're doing something great. And yet they're walking into one of the more challenging relationships that you'll ever have. That is with your spouse. And so today I want to talk uh, out of this passage of scripture, talking about Jesus, talking about the church, talking about the covenant of marriage. And, and Paul uses this illustration of the church. Uh, he uses it six times actually here in Ephesians chapter five. He mentions the word church. So I want to look at those six references and I want to discover some concepts I think that will be hopefully important uh, for all of us, whether you're married or unmarried here today. Okay, so I'm going to give you six things. Uh, if you're taking notes, you can write a couple keywords down each time. The first, is, the first keyword is source. Source, okay? Now, when we get into verse 23, I'll read it to you again and you'll catch this, this idea. It says, for the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head and of the, here's the word, church, the head of the church. I want to talk to you about this word source, okay? But before we get to that word, we've got to address a different word and it's a really loaded word and it's had a lot of problems in uh, the body of Christ as a whole and the culture has attached itself to this word and made it to be something that it really should never have become and that is the word headship, headship. I want to address a really huge concept, concept in, um, that has, I think, been misapplied for centuries, headship. It's the idea that the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. That's right out of the text. Okay, we would say, yes, amen. And then watch it get so misapplied. To be the head of something uh, today means that you are you know, in charge. That's what it kind of means. It means the buck stops with you. You're the head. Everything flows through this kind of uh, singular point of authority. And, and this is fine. This is fine, okay, until, until it's not. This is fine until it gets infused with dictatorial tendencies or it gets infused with abuse. Um, it was fine up until then, okay? When you think of like a, a corporation, a company that has a good CEO, it's just, it's just going, it's working. No one's really thinking too much about it. It's like, yeah, that's a great company. It's got a great leader. We don't think about it until it goes bad. Right, and then the papers pick it up, and this is this. This guy did this, and this guy's getting demonstrative here, and this guy's overspending here, and and, and it blows up the company because this leader went off the off the rails. 
We don't think much about these companies until they go off the rails, till the leader gets crazy. And, and this brings me to this, this concept of, of source. When we talk about a head, the head of this house, the head of the church, what we're really dealing with is the idea of a fountain, a fountain. Now, there's evidence within um, the language of the New Testament that the word head could actually mean source or fountain, the source of the origin uh, of life and of blessing. And this makes a lot of sense because even though we call you know, Jesus, the, the head of the church, we know he's not a literal head on top of some gross body. You know what I'm saying? Jesus isn't a literal head. He is the source of life for the church. Jesus is the fountainhead of life and blessing, and he invites husbands to function the same way with their spouse and with their family. I, in contrast to this, I want to tell you a true story. It's a true story. I don't know the names that are attached to this true story, but it is indeed a true story. I verified this. It was a traveling evangelist that was teaching on this topic that I'm talking to you about today. It was teaching on the topic of the man as the head, but he actually added his own nuance to it, and he said, the man is the, is the hammerhead, and the wife is the nail. Now, I don't, know if, I don't know if anyone's filming anything or if this is being captured, but so I don't want you to just isolate what the words I'm saying. I want you to keep this whole thing in context now. I'm giving you an illustration, okay? So don't anyone walk out of this room tweeting what I just said. This was this evangelist traveling through speaking at a church, teaching that the man is the hammerhead and the woman is the nail. And the role of the man, according to what he was teaching, was to, to hammer that nail into the floorboards of the house to keep the house in order. Now, this is where the true story takes a dark, dark turn. And I think you probably would even come to the same estimation as I did as I was reading the story through. I'm like, oh, this guy was probably out of control. Yes, he was. It was later confirmed that he was physically abusing his wife. Physically abusing his wife. Friends, Paul does not exhort, in the scripture, exhort the husband to subject the wife or to command her to submit. The, nor is the wife to urge that husband to be her head and to, to love her it has to be voluntary. It's got to be voluntary. Without compulsion, without being done out of some twisting of the arm, it's got to be done unto the, the reverence and the honor uh, for Jesus. That someone would willfully say, I want to lead. To command or demand that happen is really just manipulation. It's manipulation. Uh, it reminds me of, some of you have seen the movie, it's, it's old now, but my big fat Greek wedding. You know that one, right? It's, it, there's a quote in there. In my big fat Greek wedding, it says, the man is the head, but the wife is the neck, and the neck turns the head. <laughs> and we all laughed at that, right? And we laughed when that came up in the movie. But friends, that is an example of manipulation. It is a manipulation on the role of the gal. And it's manipulation even on other sides of that coin where the guy would manipulate and force the woman to submit. To be a husband is not to force anything. It's to be a fountainhead, a fountainhead of blessing. And a guy that lives that way, a guy that functions like that in his home, boy, I'll tell you what, at least in my experience, I have found that a gal, in particular my wife, would just so willingly want to be submitted to a person that loves and blesses and is a source of life and joy, just like Jesus is for the church. We want to submit to Jesus, and Jesus isn't going to beat us into submission. He, he laid his life down for us, and so should a husband, which brings me to verse 24. Look at verse 24 for this second thing. It says, now as the church submits to Christ, so the wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Let's talk about the second word, submission. Submission. As the church submits to Christ. Now, there's something you got to bring into balance here, right? Verse 21 tells us to submit to one another. That's a great little ballast, isn't it? 
Yeah, because we could get into this passage and we could start to find some real horses to ride. Oh man, yeah, lady, you better do that. And this is what you should do. No, no, verse 21 puts this whole thing into perspective. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Submit to one another. Other versions would say be subject to, and, and this, this conjures up kind of a, a weird idea that um, I want to talk about just for a second. It brings up the idea of servitude. It brings up the idea of exploitation, of this kind of oppression, like being subject to, and we struggle in that because of, the, because of what we know in culture, because of what we know where uh, domination has taken place throughout our history. But nothing, 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 I want every guy to hear me, nothing in these verses supports humiliation, nothing supports exploitation, nothing in these verses will support some kind of authoritative tyranny, nothing. Being submitted to one another means we need each other. I need you, my wife needs me, I need her, our body needs the joints and the ligaments that it has, that, that each one of us are. We need one another. And, and, and I don't know where we got, well, I do know it's from this passage. This, is one, this passage has been a little bit of a stinker for the church across the generations. But I honestly, I kind of dumbfoundingly go, it's so crazy that we've got male domination from this, as if God loves men more than women. Or if God loves men and he just tolerates women. That's not the case. It's crazy. It's not biblical. In Christ, there is neither male nor female, slave nor free, Jew nor Gentile. We are all loved and equally loved by Christ. Now, I'm not just jumping on some political bandwagon this morning. I mean, this we understand the day and age we're living in right now, and I'm not just coming at it going, man, we've got to kind of right this ship, and, and there's a lot of things happening in the paper. It's always some next, you know, hashtag me too, something going on. I'm not just talking politics here. I'm talking, friends, as the body of Christ, we have to remember we are all equal in Jesus. If you, no, I'll be really strong now. I don't know what church you come from. I, I don't presume to be your pastor, but I, I just would tell you, if you are propagating an anti-Christ notion that, that we are not all equal in Jesus, then please stop it. Please stop it. Jack Hayford, man of God, says this. These verses, Ephesians 5, these verses put such demands upon the Christian husband that it is impossible, impossible to see how a charge of male chauvinism could justly be made against the Bible or how a license to exploit women or wives could ever be claimed from such texts. So if you were looking at these passage scriptures and you're going, well, this is who I am, I'm the man, you better listen to me kind of thing. Let me tell you, that is not Jesus. Stop doing that. Stop doing that. And uh, you're just making it really, really rotten for the rest of us. Let me give you the next word. The next word is found in verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Let me talk to you about sacrifice. Sacrifice. John 3, 16, pretty familiar verse. It says, for God so loved the world, he what? Gave. gave. Okay, we're familiar with that. He gave. He gave. Christianity, in my opinion, the simplest form, is about giving. It's not about taking. Christianity is about giving. Jesus gave his life. Jesus gave of his life, his death, his burial, the resurrection. All of that was about Jesus submitting himself and sacrificing, giving of himself for the world. And he then gave, as a result, his righteousness to us. He gives of his salvation, that free gift. Uh, when he left the planet, remember when he ascended, it says he gave the spirit of God and he gave gifts we're given the word of God. We're given a love for one another. We're given the gift of the church, the body of Christ. And in a day in which we find so much selfishness, so much consumption, so many, even followers of Jesus, somehow thinking that the kingdom of God is about what they can get. 
about the things that they can accumulate. We have so much that's been weaved into the fiber and the fabric of the local church and the body of Christ as a, as a whole that's become about prosperity and what we can get. And I'm a king's kid and my God owns the cattle on a thousand hills and I should have everything. And all of those things are wonderful promises to claim. And yet, because we know the, self, the selfishness of humanity, right? How many know that if we just find verses in the Bible that tell us that we should have everything and we claim just those and we forget about the ones that tell us that if you're gonna follow Jesus, you lay down your life. You give it all, down, you give it all up. That marriage is really, it's an act of death. I don't mean to be silly about that, but think about it. When you're marrying someone, you're giving up your rights. You're laying down your life and, and we... See that in the model of the person of Jesus who freely gave. And he invites us now to freely give, to freely give. It reminds me of a husband who heard a sermon on marriage and, and how he could be more honoring, how he could be more considerate. And he decided to, to uh, surprise his wife with a box uh, of candy, like chocolates, and a dozen roses. So he goes, you know, candy, roses, and he gives it to his wife and she goes, oh! This is terrible. She's bawling. She's bawling. She's holding candy and flowers and she's crying. This is terrible. And he's just wide-eyed looking at her. And, and he's, what's wrong? What's wrong? And she goes, the baby cut his finger. I burned dinner and I couldn't get rid of this vacuum salesman that came and was there at the door forever and ever and ever. The sink is full of dishes. The toilet is plugged. And now you come home drunk. She'd never gotten that before from him, right? She's got to be drunk. Some of you will get that later uh, around lunchtime. But <laughs> friends, it should not be a surprise to your spouse if you're married when she sees you sacrificially do something for her. That shouldn't be a surprise. She shouldn't look and go, whoa, now you're drunk? No. Friends, it should be a regular behavior that we lay our lives down for our wives. Let me give you a fourth word. That's the word sanctification. Sanctification. Look at verse 27, if you will. It says, well, verse 26, I'll just work my way there. It says, to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and present her to himself as a radiant church without stain, without wrinkle, with any out blemish, holy, blameless. Friends, I could summarize that in this one word, sanctification, this presenting of a radiant church. And now remember, this mystery is about the church, and yet we're gleaning some tips and some helpful thoughts about our own marriages. How can we sanctify? How can we make our wives holy? How can we cleanse? How can we wash? How can we present her as holy and blameless? In other words, does your wife truly feel cared for? Does she truly feel attended to? It, it, is she your first thought or is she just an afterthought? I mentioned that one because of this. You know, there's always in marriage one battle that you'll just fight all the way through your marriage. You know what I'm saying? How many of you know that? It's like, you just, it's, it's just recycled. It's the same argument, just recycled over and over and over in some form or fashion. But when you really get to the root of it, it's about the same thing. And, and, and for me, for our, my wife and I, the one battle that we kind of have to work through all the time is this idea of her being my first thought versus an afterthought. We've battled with this for years because whenever something great happens in my life, I tend to call my buddy, Tim, he wouldn't believe what just happened. Oh man, I'll even be walking in the house. I'm like, yeah, it was awesome. It was so great. Well, I gotta let you go. Okay, see you, bye-bye. And I hang up and she'll say, how was your day? It was fine. It was all right. Really, tell me more. I don't know. I'm just all talked. Out. Well, you were just laughing with, I don't know. I'm just, uh, it was okay. Now, I'm telling on myself a little bit there because, because friends, when we think about our spouses, I, I want us to ask a big, big question. This is a new revelation to me as of just the last couple of months. And I say this is really fresh. This revelation of asking myself, will my wife, or does my wife, let me say it this way, does my wife look more or less like Jesus because of me? 
does she look more or less like Jesus because of me? And there's times I've had to be real honest where I've thought, probably less. Why? I, I, I want her to be my first thought, not an afterthought. I want her to be well attended to, truly cared for, to be presented, to be cleansed, to be made holy and right. And, and we know, listen, don't theologically confuse this. This isn't about us saving our spouse. We don't have that role. That's what Jesus does. But I'm telling you, as a head, as a fountainhead of blessing, we get to present. Our goal would be to cleanse her, not make her feel dirty. To present her holy and blameless and give the impression to others that that's how we see her. One of the worst things that can happen is is in mixed groups, right? Where you can just kind of bag on the other person. Maybe it's jokingly or just poking fun. My wife and I were only married one year, and we were at a a gathering of pastoral people and staff members. We were fresh on a staff in in Washington State, and we were married one year, and we were in a circle of people, and and I'm kind of a joker, and I just was kind of poking fun, but you know how you kind of poke fun at another person's expense, and I was just kind of joking about something that I knew about her that no one else knew. I'm like, oh yeah, well listen, my wife, you wouldn't believe what, and and it was this, back and forth, and she was like, oh yeah, we're doing this? Okay, well, and she said something and got a laugh, and we left that evening, and we drove without speaking the whole way home. And I could feel it. I'm like, what's the deal? She's like, the way you made me feel back there was so bad. I said, the way you, I made you, the way you it was the way you were made me. And we just went back and forth until we finally just pulled the car over. And I looked at her and said, I'm so sorry. I knew exactly what I was doing. And we made a commitment that day. This was one year into marriage. It was a serious, it was a covenant that we made. We made a covenant. We would only laugh at each other's strengths. Never our weaknesses. That in a group of people, we would only laugh. Like, oh man, we would just talk about our strengths and make people laugh. That we love still making people laugh, but the idea of ever poking fun at someone's weakness, we just said, it'll never happen again. And in 27 years, it's never happened again. Friends, we get to sanctify. We get to cleanse. We get to point out all that is great about our spouses. Anything less than that is is really a violation of how God sees them. Here's what I encourage you to do, and we'll just wrap up with the next two points, but I want to encourage you at some point, maybe it's on the back side of this little note that you were given about your, your teammates, but on the back side, why don't you just write down like three, don't do it now, but just think about it. Write down three really positive characteristics of your spouse and take those three, even if you have to like pull the card out of your pocket tonight and look at it again, just for the next two weeks straight, just be looking at those, that list and just tell your spouse those things like, I really love it when you do this. I see this in you. You're really great at this. Just point out those positive things. We're all too quick to point out the negative, but let's point out those things that really bring about a sanctifying work in their hearts and in their lives. Let's go to number five. Number five, it's in verse 29. Verse 29 has to do with support, if you want to write that word down, support. It says, after all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and they care for their body just as Christ does the church. We support, we feed, and we care. In the New King James language, it says nourish and cherish. To nourish means to to support a person's growth in a particular way towards maturity. To nourish, to support. And what every spouse wants to know, ultimately, what your spouse wants to know, what my spouse wants to know, what your future spouse wants to know if you're unmarried is this. Are you with me? Are you on my side? I don't want to be against you. I want us to do this together. And to support that person is a similar thing that Jesus does to us. He feeds us through the word. He nourishes us. He takes us from where we're at and makes us better. And when we don't feed and care for our spouse, our marriages become weak. They become sick. And they often will just flat out die. Some of you know what I'm talking about. You've seen this. 
You've watched it in your own life where you have separated from and you've pulled away from and you're no longer nourishing and caring and feeding and supporting your spouse, your loved one. The one that really you said on a stage somewhere or in a courthouse somewhere, you said, till death do us part. Now, what does that mean up until the time we die? Is that means we get to just lay our life down, give our best to that person, to feed and to care for that person. And when we do that, we interrupt what Emmerich Eckridge has called the crazy cycle. The crazy cycle happens when wives won't submit to someone that doesn't love them and cherish them. How many know it's very difficult for a gal to say, oh yeah, I'm just gonna respect you, but you don't love me. But if a guy will begin to love and pour out this cherishing love on their spouse, what will happen is any gal that is submitted to Jesus and, 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 and really wants to make a marriage work will look and say, I will ultimately come around and begin to respect this idea of honor, this idea of, of submitting when that is found in a place where it's safe and that guy is laying his life down for that gal, man, I, I don't know every woman in the world, but I know, that I know one really well. She'll say, oh, I'll submit to that. I want to submit to that because you are cherishing me and supporting me and loving me. This last reference I want to take you to is really uh, bringing us full circle, and I'll finish here and we'll pray and and, and, uh, and grab a bite to eat. But it's in verse 32, and it says, this is a profound mystery. We, we acknowledge that, right? It's a total mystery. But Paul says, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. There's that sixth reference to the church. Let's talk about Christ and the church. If you want a, an S word, I'm a preacher, I like to put everything in the first letters the same, you know. Let's talk about Jesus as Savior. The Savior of the world but not just the world, but the savior of our own hearts and lives. Friends, when you bring it all down and you boil it down to its most common denominators, every one of us have different marriages and different relationships and different backgrounds, but we have one savior. We have Jesus. When the church gets off Jesus, it has big problems. And when marriages get off Jesus, they have big problems. Okay, big problems. Keep your eyes on Jesus. If you're divorced here today or, or perhaps remarried, I, can I just encourage you just to keep Jesus central in your marriages? You may say, man, I've got a next, I'm, I'm going to do it differently this time. Really? Okay. That's great. I love the exuberance. But, but if you don't bring Jesus into that, it's probably going to end up looking the same way it was back then. Make sure Jesus is central. I feel really bad for the poor guy that was telling me how unlucky he was in his marriages. He said this, he says, my first wife left me and my second wife won't. And um, this is a joke. <laughs> oh, it's, it was a joke, it was a joke. So maybe you're divorced here today, maybe you're remarried and you may say, man, I got, a next, I got another shot to make this work. Okay, make sure that shot has Jesus right in the middle of it all. Okay, perhaps you're single. We already acknowledge there's a couple single guys in this room. Would you, in this season of your life, make sure Jesus is central? Make the kinds of good choices today to become a person that allows Jesus to be your primary passion. Uh, and, and, and really, as you're looking for a marriage partner, you gotta believe someone else is looking at you potentially. And if Jesus isn't central in your life, that right now, don't make this assumption that somehow when I get married, I'll bring Jesus into it. No, 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 make sure Jesus is in it right now. How many know this is all about Jesus? It's all about Jesus, okay? So with that, would you just even hold out your hands and, and, and just as a symbol of your marriage is being held in the palms of your hands, we just declare to you, Jesus, these marriages, they're not ours, they're yours. And we need you right in the middle of them. Lord, we look to you as our savior, not just saving us from hell, from eternity separated from the father, but Lord, your saving work even comes in to redeem and restore marriages and to bring about health and, and to resurrect things that are dead. Lord, I have watched you firsthand. I have watched you bring, Lord, marriages back from death. 
Lord, where they have had such devastation take place in them and they have submitted themselves to your will and to your way and, to, and really to your grace. And we've watched, Lord, these marriages get restored and become stronger than they ever were. Lord, I believe in your resurrection power. And the same power that raised Christ from the dead, it can quicken our mortal bodies. And I believe it can quicken our marriages. And so, Lord, bring about health. I pray for those that today, that in their hands, Lord, they're holding up to you some real brokenness. Lord, where perhaps there's been a lack of conversation, there's been struggle in, in their home, maybe sexually, or maybe there's been infidelity. Lord, whatever it is, we're just lifting it to you. And I pray that your grace would cover it, Lord, not to hide it, Lord, but really to expose it, to bring about then healing and wholeness. And we now together just join our hearts and we pray for our wives. Lord, you love them more than we do, but I pray that we can reflect that love, we can display that love, we can present that love as we present them to you, holy, blameless, without blemish. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen? Amen. Amen.